very warm welcome to all of you this afternoon. Uh, as is customary, I'd just like to uh, offer some thanks uh, right at the outset. I know that others will also uh, be uh, showing their acknowledgements and thanks to people. In the first instance to Penang Institute, and in particular to uh, Winky Beg and Xiao Wu for uh, hosting us here this afternoon in this wonderful auditorium. Some of you know this space very well, others, for others it will be the first time that we are here. And thank you all for sparing uh, the time on this Saturday afternoon uh, to, to come out. The making of a book is always a, a collective endeavour. And uh, uh, in that regard, I think it's uh, only appropriate to uh, uh, signal out at the very beginning uh, some of those who have been uh, involved in the making of the book. And of course, uh, the first who should be mentioned are the two principles of the publisher, Entrepot Publishing, a uh, wonderful, new, uh, small imprint based here in Penang, who are committed uh, entirely to the production of high quality volumes that I think will certainly enhance uh, the intellectual uh, life and understanding of Penang. So uh, a thank you very much to uh, Marcus Langdon and to Keith Hopton uh, of Ultra Publishing. <laughs> if you read the small blur uh, about Entrepo in the book, you will see that they have commitment to high quality production values. And many people have remarked on indeed the, the, the actually the very lovely uh, 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 sense of the as an artifact, as a book, beautifully designed and uh, very well illustrated. And that's no little thanks to the book's designer, and I do want to, to, to signal that she's come back to her hometown this weekend, especially for this event. Uh, please give a, a, a warm hand to Jane Coe, the designer of the book. Jane Coe. Gareth Richards, I'm going to be your host for this afternoon. I had the honour uh, and privilege of uh, editing the book, which meant working very closely with the author over a number of months. And uh, as with all the best editorial work, it's a great learning experience and a sharing experience. And, a, 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 and the end product, I think, is something that when you read the book, will you'll find it uh, uh, a really brilliant and successful uh, piece of historical scholarship. Uh, I feel a little bit subdued. I just want to share with you some news. Uh, some of you will know uh, about this already. Uh, but a very dear friend, a dear friend of mine personally, of Penang Institute and indeed of the Bookshop, uh, died this morning, uh, Raymond Rashid, the, 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 the writer, uh, a very famous journalist here in Malaysia. Uh, a man whose love of language was second to none, and who just last year published two masterly uh, books, Peninsula, uh, a full feature book on his take on the state of the country and of its peoples, and then a very small, beautifully done little book called Small Town. Raymond died uh, after not recovering from the massive heart attack he had in January, uh, and I just would like you to have him in your thoughts and prayers uh, at this particular time. Um, the format for this afternoon is going to run something like this. Uh, we'll have a little opening address from uh, a dear friend, a dear friend of the bookshop of Penang Institute, uh, Dr. Anwar Ibrahim. discussant of the book, uh, uh, a young man who finally, after 40 years, 
found his way home, Dr. Uiki Beng, who has been gallivanting across the face of the earth, uh, especially for the last few years as the Deputy Director of ICS, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, but of course is a Penang boy through and through. And he's just in his very first month as the director of this esteemed institution. And this is your first public gig as the new director. So we have the great and the good for you. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about each of the, the, the speakers uh, uh, as they, they come up uh, to the front. Uh, but to open, I, it gives me very great pleasure to uh, invite Anwar Faisal to make an opening address. He's obviously very well known to a great many of you, perhaps not all of you. Um, if I uh, even began to give uh, or list his accomplishments, uh, we'd never get out of here. Uh, suffice to say that he's the chairperson of the Right Livelihood uh, Award often known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, and indeed was a recipient of the prize himself in days gone by. He is, amongst other things, uh, the chairperson of Think City, but even more so, uh, he, he's been a leading activist uh, for the environment, and particularly for consumer affairs, over many, 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 many decades. Uh, <laughs> And possibly the next time you see him, the shoe will be on the other foot because uh, Anwar and I are actually working on a collection of his essays, which are focusing mainly on urban issues and sustainability issues. And inshallah, that will be out uh, in, within the next two or three months. Please give a very warm welcome to Anwar Kaiser. Thank you, Gareth, for those uh, nice words. Gareth has asked me to say a few words, uh, but I'm going to disappoint him because uh, I always find that impossible, except in the presence of my wife, and she's not here. So <laughs> you know, there will be a little bit, uh, a bit uh, more. Uh, Dr. Uy, uh, welcome back to Penang. And it's wonderful to feel the vibrance of Penang uh, in this particular audience because there's something very special about Penang. It's our feeling about the place, our feeling about history, our feeling about issues. And today, uh, we begin also a very interesting uh, journey. We're going to have a look at uh, a very special person, or you can say series of persons, a very special uh, place, you know, uh, Singapore, uh, and also uh, challenges with regard to historical narratives. Uh, it's going to be about uh, justice, it's about justice, it's about history, and it's also very interestingly connected with uh, Penang and Malacca. And I often joke, uh, although he's come back there, I think he's come back exactly for the reasons of this very famous <laughs> Chinese saying in the straight settlements about Penang, Singapore, and uh, Malacca. Make money in Singapore retire in Penang and die in Malacca. <laughs> I think the first two you can understand very clearly. The third some of you may be curious about. Yeah? That's because they have the best feng shui in their cemeteries. <laughs> you know Bukit China, yeah? <laughs> you also have chosen a very historic day for this event. It's the day when Singapore became self-governing. That's uh, today. Today is also the day when uh, Kafka, you know, because the story is a bit Kafkaish sometimes, you know, uh, uh, the Kafka died and, and uh, the intrigues and the conflicts and the misrepresentations over not just a short period, over long, over decades, and you know, you can say centuries now, yeah, about various contestations about. Uh, uh, they're very compelling, interesting uh, stories of uh, links with Penang. Uh, in many ways, we were very happy that people like Fakwa, uh, you know, who, uh, I mean, I say Fakwa, I hope it's okay. It's, it's, it's one of the big problems about the name in Penang and in many places is that nobody wants to open their mouth to say it, you know, because, you know, it sounds something, you know, that 
somebody the other day asked me, you know, there's a, you opened up a fucker mansion, you know, it's safe. But, I, but I went there and uh, they're not serving prostitutes, you know. <laughs> but that's just a joke, yeah. Hey, uh, this is illustrious also because there was a part about that, it was a part about internet. Yeah? And uh, the linkage between the two and the stories of both of them is also fascinating, it's so rich. And I think this particular book also opens up all kinds of narratives uh, and all kinds of new stories. And one of the things that, uh, as a chairman of Think City, we're trying to unveil, bring, sprout out all kinds of stories. Uh, his stories, her stories, our stories, you know, world stories, and all their connectivity with the place. A story of many, many small things. And I think this book itself triggers out a lot of options. Like one of the things that I got fascinated in because uh, in a way, his story, a bit like Francis Light too, you know, he had a Eurasian wife, you know. Papa also had a Eurasian wife, you know. It's very interesting, yeah? and I'd like to know more about her, you know, and her story and uh, many things like that. And then that would be a kind of her story, yeah, in... Uh, in, uh, in so, it's uh, wonderful to have uh, so many of you. I think the history of the past can only be, uh, you know, sometimes it's too much of just a puppet show. Uh, but I think when we begin to have books of the scholarly kind that we have here, with the kinds of references, they open up a whole history of uh, many things that I think we all need to be appreciating. Uh, sometimes also history is just the propaganda of the victorious. Uh, I think Singapore needed a hero. Uh, and uh, when they were looking and there were a lot of discussions about where Singapore should be going, uh, actually one of the recommendations was bring people like Raffles back and make him the center of the stage, you know, and you find huge number of things named after Raffles and nothing, nothing after Raffles, you know? a lane that disappeared, you know, a, a mountain, uh, a mount that's been uh, flattened. Uh, we in Penang remember our history, thank God, you know, and then we are actually nourishing it and keeping it. So with that, I'd like to welcome all of you again to what's going to be a very, very interesting story. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Anwar. I, I always love the way you make uh, interesting connections. I, I didn't know it was uh, Kafka's uh, uh, death day, is that the way? The, the anniversary of his death. So a Kafkaesque story awaits us. At this particular moment, I'd please like to welcome to the stage, and we have a little unveiling ceremony that's going to take place. We do these nice rituals and so on. To join Dato on stage, uh, Hibeng and uh, Nadia. This is the photo opportunity. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, this is the official launch of William Parker and Singapore by Nadia Wright. One, two, three. One. Two, three. Yeah. Oh. You thought you should get one picture with the real book <laughs> and the real author.
as you know, it's, it's, the, it's the custom when uh, Penang Institute and the bookshop uh, do uh, book launches of this kind, is in fact to focus on the ideas, the content, and to begin to generate a, a conversation, a discussion about the kind of ideas that are represented. Um, so I'm very, very happy uh, to be able to introduce you, Dr. Nadia Wright. Uh, she should be very well known to you uh, initially as a scholar of the Armenian community here in Southeast Asia. Uh, in fact, uh, more than 15 years ago, she published uh, a pioneering study that looked at this very small but nonetheless influential, historically influential community. Uh, and self-evidently, you all know, therefore, the reason for Armenian Street in, down, in the downtown of Georgetown. Um, and obviously you all know uh, that the uh, historic Eno Hotel, the forerunner of the raffles in Singapore, was founded by the Sarkis brothers, Armenians. Uh, since then, uh, Nadia has uh, published a book on Singapore's national flower. If you want to know more about that, you want to ask her. Uh, but obviously, uh, over the last decade or so, uh, as part of her uh, doctoral dissertation at the University of Melbourne, uh, she focused in particular on this story, uh, a story that raised all kinds of questions for, in her mind of the founding of Singapore. Please give a very warm welcome to Nadia Wright. Melbourne, not London. Um, 
Knowing that the real origins of Singapore's national flower, the Vandalus joachim, had been superseded by an imaginary story, I wondered if something similar had occurred with the origins of British Singapore. Thus I thought an investigation into the roles of Rappels and Farka might prove feasible. And it did. And it was further encouraged by the wording on Farka's epitaph. Now if you notice, it expressly says that he founded Singapore. And I found that quite fascinating. So, several issues came up. Why is Raffles so revered in Singapore's history? Why has this remained so after Singapore's independence? And why were Raffles' early biographers so scathing of Farka? The history is very full of fascinating whys. And these questions are addressed in my book as I explain why Farka has been overlooked and even mocked in the Singapore story. The all too common occurrence of a senior official taking credit over his subordinate was just too simplistic to explain what had happened. I turned mainly to two contrasting types of sources. The first, the biographies of Raffles, which glorified him, and belittled Farka. And then the East India Company records, plus other contemporary documents, which presented very different perspectives. Now, I guess we must remember that history is fluid. Its interpretations change over time and also depend on the agenda of the writer. And this becomes very obvious when we look at the biographies of Sir Stanford Raffles. of Raffles and the maligning of Farka had its origins with Demetrius Bolger's 1897 biography of Raffles. This book was growingly written by a devotee of Raffles and also written in the heyday of the British Empire. And it depicted Raffles as a man who had risen from poverty, who was forced to leave school early to support his family and through his efforts alone, had risen to great fame. None of that was true, as my book explains. But it has become part of the mesmerizing myth of Raffles and helped create an enduring fascination with him. Bolger further declared that Raffles was the sole founder and developer of Singapore, and he scathingly dismissed any role for Farka. Bolger's views were repeated without questioning and even embellished by later biographers and writers. Then, in Singapore, Raffles has been extensively memorialised, further added to his aura. Although Raffles' role was periodically raised in the press, defended by historians such as Mary Turnbull and Ernest Chu and John Baston, and more recently included in the school history curriculum, ultimately Raffles prevailed, as his biographies and their reprints continued to hold sway. With Raffles so deeply entrenched as Singapore's founder and symbol, there seemed little reason to investigate the accomplishments of Farka. Interestingly, one school group concluded that Raffles was the real founder of Singapore, as all the history books say so, and because he had a statue and railway station named after him, whereas Farker had nothing. Indeed, Farker was destined to suffer the fate of the converse of memorialization, that is, the phenomenon, phenomenon of forgetting, which is, of course, the Achilles heel of history. So William Farker, Singapore's first and only commandant and resident is nothing named after him. Farker Road, Mount Farker, and Farker Strait have all disappeared 
from the Met. The Overship Farmer Strait. The overshadowing of Farquhar began with his administration of Malacca, which was denigrated by Raffles, and hence his biographies. <coughs> now, I should point out at this stage that there was another Farquhar active in this region, one you're all familiar with, Robert Townsend Farquhar, who was a distant relative of William by marriage. Whoops. The two men are sometimes confused, especially over the destruction of Malacca. In 1804, when Robert Farquhar was Lieutenant Governor of Penang, he had strongly advocated the destruction of the fort and the town to protect Penang's trade. Now, William Farquhar had arrived in Malacca as part of the British Occupation Forces in 1795. He was appointed Commandant in 1803, and in recognition of his wide responsibilities, his title was extended to Commandant and Resident in 1812. Farquhar was a trained engineer, a military engineer, a very methodical man. But he was a man with vision, both for the East India Company and for Britain. As early as 1808, he drew up a draft treaty with neighbouring sultans in order to extend British influence in the Malay Peninsula. However, the East India Company did not want to get involved in local politics. A few years later, he advocated the invasion of Java before the Dutch reinforcements arrived. But his ideas were premature and later Raffles claimed the credit for suggesting the Java invasion. <clears throat> now, as Malacca was under the control of Penang during Farquhar's 15-year rule there, he was answerable to two lieutenant governors and nine governors, and he managed to cope with them all. He was a very efficient administrator, highly praised by his superiors, his financial accounts were never queried, and the Penang government called upon him for engineering advice, <coughs> such as on the new jail and the wharf. Farquhar increased Malacca's trade. He built roads, including one out to Nani, which was also a subsidiary of Malacca, and he built the lighthouse on St. Paul's Hill. He turned around Malacca's economy, from several hundred dollars in the treasury, it rose to over $30,000, and the Penang government was very prompt to requisition a large part of that. Farquhar achieved the increase in revenue, largely by reintroducing and amending the Dutch licenses, or monopolies, on the sale of goods and services. However, there was one he refused to reintroduce, and that was the cockfighting license. Farquhar deplored that activity. He was also opposed to slavery. After implementing British laws declaring the slave trade a felony, he promptly closed loopholes when he saw that regulations were being evaded. Farquhar was not afraid to speak his mind. In 1806, when asked about Malacca's future, <coughs> He, compo he composed a very moving and eloquent memorandum, arguing that the fort should not be destroyed and that the town should not be evacuated. However, London had determined on destruction. <clears throat> when Farquhar received orders to proceed with this, he made another desperate appeal against it, but was curtly reprimanded and ordered to start demolition. When that was nearly complete, Raffles, who was then the secretary of Penang, wrote to Lord Minto, right, urging him not to evacuate the town. Raffles had plagiarised Farquhar's emotive words and sound arguments. 
And whereas Graffel's letter is quoted as proof of his statesmanship, Farkas Mimo is largely forgotten. Now, it was not Raffles who saved the church and the state house and two of the fort's gates from destruction. It was Farker. And actually not for any altruistic reason, but because he needed them for military and administrative purposes. Whoops. Sorry, I'm on the wrong way with that. Yeah, he kept those ones. Farker greatly assisted Raffles when Minto appointed him as agent to collect intelligence on Java for the impending invasion. He drew up maps, provided local information, went on reconnaissance, and as well coped with the arrival of over 11,000 British troops in Malacca. Farker took part in the invasion and was offered the post of resident at Jakarta. He declined in order to return to Malacca, where his de facto wife, Nonio Clement, and their five children lived. After Napoleon was defeated in 1815, the British knew they would have to return Malacca to the Dutch. Farker wrote another compelling memo, hoping that Malacca might still be retained. Meanwhile, the merchants in Penang whose trade had expanded during the British occupation of Malacca and especially Java, became increasingly worried that their inroads into new markets might be curtailed after the Dutch reclaimed their positions. They and Farka pressed Bannerman to take actions to protect British commercial interests. <gasps> to do this, Bannerman sent Farka on a diplomatic mission and in August 1818, Farkas secured a trade treaty with Sultan Abdul Rahman of the Johor Empire. And this treaty gave Britain most favoured nation status and trade monopolies. He signed a similar treaty with the Sultan of Siam too. But Farkas knew that something more substantial than a trade treaty was needed to protect the British interests. He had earlier advocated founding a new base south of the Malacca Straits and now urgently suggested the Caramons. But, Bannerman, but, yeah. but Bannerman prevaricated. He was too concerned at the costs of defence and development. Meanwhile, Farker wrote to the Raja Muda, who was the effective ruler of the Johor Empire, who agreed to a British survey, provided he could discuss matters first with Fargo. Bannerman relayed that information to Hastings. Now, Hastings was being further pressured by Calcutta merchants and then by Raffles, who had arrived in the city to take action. And Hastings agreed to build upon the strong footing obtained by Farker's treaties. Thus, he sent Raffles on a two-fold mission. First, he was to settle the dynastic dispute in Arche, and then he was to establish a new post at Rio. Now, Rio had long been suggested by Raffles as a potential site, and also by Farker. Because of Farker's experience and expertise, Hastings appointed him to take charge of any new post. However, he would be subordinate to Raffles, who was based in Mikulin. The two men met up in Penang, and on the 19th of January, Raffles' little flotilla set sail for the Caramons. As they proved unsuitable, Farker suggested Singapore as a site. And Raffles and Farker landed there on the 28th of January. Raffles who also had recently contemplated Singapore as an option, realized it was an ideal spot. And th this is one of the earliest images of Singapore. <coughs> but there was a problem. The island formed part of the Johor Empire, which was controlled by the Dutch. Now, Raffles got around this by illegally installing Tonkulong the Sultan of Johor's brother, 
as the new Sultan of Jabal. And then he claimed that he was independent of the Dutch and therefore he could sign a treaty with him in the Timbergol. And by this treaty, the East India Company rented a small piece of ground on which to establish an armed British trading post. And these are the limits of the early settlement. It extended <coughs> only from Tanjong Canton in the north to Tanjong Milan in the south and inland for about one mile. The rest of the island belonged to the Malays. And within the British area, the compounds of the Sultan and the Temengong were exempt from British regulations. Now, Raffles did not purchase the island of Singapore in 1819, nor did he acquire it as often claimed. Indeed, acquisition was far from guaranteed. After drawing up general regulations, Raffles departed with the name. Understandably, the Dutch were furious at his actions, and even the East India Company was not happy. Diplomatic protests began, and reports were received that the Dutch would retake the post by force. Evocatively, Bannerman tried to persuade Parker that neither his honour as a soldier nor the honour of the British government ex what's the word? called upon him to remain. Gee, one word can really throw me. <laughs> um, he left it to Farquhar to decide whether he would be, quote, justified in shedding blood to retain the post. Farquhar refused to abandon it. He knew it was the East India Company's last chance to obtain a new base. Then, the Sultan and the Temengong had second thoughts about having signed the treaty, and they wrote to the real Sultan of Johor and the Rajamuda, asking for forgiveness and accusing Raffles of having coerced them into signing. It was Farquhar who persuaded the nobles to retract those statements. Thus his actions in the initial few months ensured that the post remained in British hands, again, at least for the time being. The, gov the Baron Van der Capellen, the Governor General of the Dutch East Indies, continued with his adamant protests that Ravel's so-called Sultan Hussein was a usurper who had no right to allow the British to establish a post and he wanted it back. While the diplomats argued in Europe, Farga began developing the post. And it's not always appreciated that he was building the settlement from scratch, with limited manpower, few resources, and little money. He set about clearing the jungle and swamp, building defences, accommodation, roads, bridges, etc. The population grew as people from Malacca who knew and respected Farka flocked to Singapore to find work or to trade. The very wealthy Tanchi Sang, who had formed a very close rapport with Farka in Malacca, followed him to Singapore, bringing capital for investment and trade and leadership expertise. Entrepreneurs including Tan Tok Sing and Tan Kim Sing soon followed. Raffles returned to Singapore in late May, but stayed just under one month. He was delighted at the metamorphosis of the post, commenting on the many ships in the harbour and the extensive campongs. And he wrote to his friend the Duchess of Somerset, claiming all the credit. Singapore is a child of my own, and I have made it what it is. You may easily conceive with what zeal I apply myself to clearing the forests, cutting of roads, building of towns, framing of laws, etc., etc. Raffles failed to mention that he hadn't been in Singapore and that Farker had done all the work. Farker wrote to local rulers 
encouraging them to trade at Singapore, and he emphasized its facilities, its extensive safe roadstead, and the gateway it offered to the Eastern Archipelago. Plus, its free trade status, although Raffles had intended that to be a very temporary measure, as had occurred in Penang. Farka opened up trade with Brunei and hoped to extend it to Siam and even Japan. Malay expert Annabel Tay Gallup attributed Farka's success in attracting regional commerce to his very successful diplomatic correspondence. By 1822, Singapore's trade had topped 8 million Spanish dollars, that's about 2 million pounds sterling. It was mainly in regional produce. Opium topped the list, followed by Indian peace goods, currency and tin. Now it's not often realized that Raffles hoped that Singapore would be the outlet for supplying opium to the Eastern Archipelago. And this is what he had to say about opium. He wanted it protected at all costs. Farquhar envisaged Singapore as the new emporium of the East, outdoing even Batavia. But his ambitions were hampered by reality. Firstly, Hastings doubted the legality of Raffles' treaty, and he was certain the post would be returned to the Dutch. Hence, in September 1819, he ordered severe reductions on costs and personnel, and ordered that no new construction work was to begin. Secondly, as the population increased, so did the, excuse me, so did the crime rate, largely due to gambling and the smoking of opium. Farker planned to control those activities by selling licenses for the sale of harap and opium and the running of gaming houses. That would also generate much needed revenue from which he could pay for a police force which was also necessary. Now please note he did not introduce a cockfighting license which he's often accused of doing. Farker has been accused of disobeying Raffles orders by introducing those licenses. That is quite untrue. Raffles issued instructions for the introduction and continuation of the licenses. Furthermore, he took a 5% commission on the opium license. His main concern seemed to be how much money the licenses were bringing in. But to protect the image of Raffles as a high principled man, his biographers had to distance him from the opium license in particular. And they did that by making Farker the scapegoat. But the opium farms introduced by Farker and authorized by Raffles became Singapore's largest single source of income until 1910. Farker also rediscovered the nearby deep water harbor, which he called New Harbor. This was renamed Keppel Harbor in 1900. He established the first experimental and botanical garden in 1819. He reserved a large tract of land, which became the Esplanade. And he drew several maps of Singapore, including this fine example from 1822, which he donated to the East India Company Library in 1825. Now, while Farker was efficiently developing Singapore and its trade, Raffles remained in Vinculu and took only a periodic interest in the settlement. It now had a population of 5,000 people, and he was most tardy in replying to Farker's letters, even urgent ones. And he seemed to hinder rather than support the work which Farker was doing. Returning in October 1822 after three and a half years' absence, he was at first delighted with Singapore's rapid progress and again took all the credit. 
and now I have the right. However, he decided to demolish much of the town and remodel it according to his new plans. Raffles was now in poor health and intended to return to England in mid-1824. Believing that Britain would probably retain Singapore, he saw that his last chance to retire in glory was to re reclaim Singapore as his own by stamping his authority on it. And he had a weapon. Raffles had set aside land at Kampong Glam, or East Beach, um, for the European merchants. But they were most unhappy with that location, as it was unsuitable for loading and unloading goods. Instead, they wanted to build their go-downs along the north bank of the Singapore River. But Raffles had reserved that land for the government. Aware that merchants were very vital to Singapore's future, Father <coughs> had allowed them to provisionally build the go-downs there. As he said, if he had not done so, quote, Singapore would have completely withered in the bud. Raffles continued to complain to Hastings that Farga had deviated from instructions by allowing that construction on the North Bank. And he claimed that he had to demolish those buildings and others at great cost to the government. Then, realising that his original orders to build on the East Bank were impracticable, Raffles sought another location and he chose the swampy south bank of the river, where in 1819 he had ordered the Chinese to establish their camp on. Thus, he was ignoring the very instruction which he had accused Parker of disobeying, and disregarding the need for economy which he had so impressed upon Parker, Raffles ordered a small hill to be levelled and the earth used to fill a nearby swamp. He began making life very difficult for Farker by sending unjustified complaints to Ben Gore. Raffles repeated his earlier complaints that Farker had overspent, but then later withdrew the complaint. He asked his friend Nathaniel Wallach to hint to Hastings that Farker had illegally acquired huge tracts of land, but he withdrew that also. Raffles also complained without basis that Farker had not given a detailed account of the lands he had allotted and that he had favoured individuals by granting land. These terrible seeds of doubt had been sown and wouldn't go away. In Singapore, Raffles began to sideline Farker. He took Farker's place at the weekly Sultan's Court he set up a town committee from which he excluded Farker and instead relied on young Philip Jackson for engineering advice. Despite these rebuffs, Farker cooperated fully with Raffles' committee, giving advice and allowing Jackson to use his maps. Farker's and Raffles' differing attitudes on the status of Singapore further strained relations between the two men. Raffles saw Singapore as a British port. Farker regarded it as an Asian port. Don't forget there were only nine Europeans in Singapore at this time. It really was, it really was an Asian port. And it, it still belonged to the Malay rulers. Farker had insisted on abiding carefully on the terms of the treaty signed by the Sultan and the Temenggong. And we should note that without them, Singapore would not have been founded. For example, Farker tactfully suggested his concern when Raffles began to sell off many blocks of land and at inflated prices. And Farker pointed out that Raffles had no authority to sell this land. The land belonged to the Malays, and in effect, Raffles was selling off the landlord's property. But Raffles merely regarded this as more of Farker's opposition to his plans, as he did when Farker offered sound advice on gambling and opium licenses. Raffles wrote to Hastings on the 11th of January 
stating that he didn't consider Farga capable of running Singapore after he had resigned. Hence, he advocated that Farga be quickly replaced by a more competent local authority. Yet, the very next day, Raffles wrote the following words to his cousin. Again, he was ecstatic at Singapore's progress, which had all been made under Farga. We see words most satisfactory, glad in your heart. Singapore has already become a great emporium. Houses and warehouses are springing up in every direction. And th this is just a picture of some of the early houses. But in two further dispatches to Hastings, Raffles accused Farker of mismanagement, incompetence and irregularities. Barker's fate was sealed. On the 1st of May, 1823, Raffles dismissed Farker as resident and took over control of Singapore. He had no authority to do that. Farker was humiliated as he had committed no crime warranting his dismissal and he protested to the Bengal government. However, swayed by Raffles' dispatches, but very concerned at the lack of evidence supporting the accusations, Hastings had already appointed John Crawford to take charge. Upon Crawford's arrival, Raffles then dismissed Parker as Commandant, again without authority from Hastings and without due cause. Parker left Singapore in December 1823, embittered by his unjustified fall from grace, but no doubt cheered by the heartfelt farewells addressed to him by the Boogies, Chinese, and Indian communities. Now, I've included these in full in the book, as I feel that they show the depth of, affect, of affection and respect these people felt for Farker. The European merchants were more circumspect in their written farewell, but they had collect, collected $3,000 for a gift, and that's a tremendous amount of money in those days. The Chinese had wished to present him with a gold cup, but they weren't allowed to because of the protocol, so they raised $700. The money from both communities was sent to London, where it bought beautiful silverware, presented to Farker in London, 1826. First, the silver epurnia from the Chinese inhabitants, acknowledging Farquhar's administration in Malacca and Singapore. And, what has not been seen before in public, this magnificently engraved cup from the European and the Armenian merchants. In London, Farquhar composed a memorial to the Court of Directors complaining of Raffles' harsh treatment and his unjustified dismissal, and he petitioned to be reinstated. It was a war of words. Raffles was battling for his pension, and Farker for his reputation, and Farker lost. <coughs> Protocol, changing political scene, and above all, Raffles' misrepresentations and untruths prevailed. My book provides the first documented account of those proceedings, and I will leave it to the reader to decide on how honest Raffles was in refuting Farker's charges, and of the justice of the Court of Directors decision. So in conclusion, the popular notion that Raffles was a benevolent, self-made hero who was responsible for British Singapore's acquisition and success, and that Farquhar was a short-sighted, incompetent, and disobedient subordinate, cannot be substantiated. Raffles' reputations and actions had been glorified by his biographers at the expense of Farquhar. In two years' time, modern Singapore commemorates its bicentenary. Farker deserves as much credit in that story as Raffles. His role in events leading to 
establishing a footing at Singapore had been overlooked. Then after Raffles raised the flag, Barker kept it flying. He developed the settlement into such a commercial success that in 1824, Britain decided to retain it. And it is time for William Farquhar, Singapore's founding resident and commandant, to step out from Raffles' shadow. Thank you. Let me start by thanking Gareth for, for inviting me to, to speak at this very important event. Uh, the timing is very good for me, of course, uh, and it's about Singapore. And I've just come from there after spending 14 years there. Um, now, I'm, I'm not really a historian. I mean, I'm not even an amateur historian. I'm just, I'm an incidental historian. Yeah? Uh, because I write biographies and I'm a psychologist, and so you can't get away from Singapore. From, from uh, history, unless you're in Singapore. <laughs> uh, but there is a great difference, I do feel, and I may mention that here, between Singapore and Penang, uh, Singapore seems to look into the future all the time, trying to play down the importance of history. While in Penang, uh, we notice in the Penang Monthly, whenever we carry anything that is on history, the hits on the web shoots up. It can be of anything, cockfighting. <laughs> Anything at all. So that's a great difference there. Uh, I was talking to, to Dato Anwar earlier. I hope it's not because Penang has a feeling that you know it, everything is just passing away. You better grab whatever you can before it's all gone. Um, I hope that's not the case. But anyway, I'm very glad to be here to, to be allowed to, to discuss and to to read this wonderful book, William Farquhar. I'll say Farquhar. William Farquhar in Singapore. Um, now, one of our good historian's many tasks, I think, is to remind readers of what has been forgotten and of how that which has been forgotten may have influenced what are now taught to be unmitigated truths. History is not something that can be complete, far from it, just as it, has never, just as it is never possible to experience the present holistically, no matter how many news articles you read today. The present always becomes the past, and the, and the two remain inseparable. And the past, in turn, is something that slowly settles, obscuring as often as it educates. And slowly but surely, it becomes hard and true, just like a cement pavement drying in the sun. But like a recalcitrant and naughty child, then, a good historian tries to put his, in this case, uh, uh, imprint on the pavement before it is fully hardened, reminding us that any flat and neat pavement is in fact a lie. Now, when, when Marcus and Gareth asked me to be a discussant at this launch, um, I agreed without hesitation. There are many reasons for this. My great interest as someone born and raised in Penang had often been the phenomenon we know as Penang, a phenomenon that cannot be fully dissociated from the phenomenon we know as Singapore, and from the phenomenon we, we call Malaysia for the matter. In significant ways, then, Singapore's founding, 43 years after Francis Light landed in Penang, uh, were together, was together domino bricks being arranged for in a historical context. The two islands were being acquired as part of Britain's expansion towards China. Designed by the fortunes of war, uh, yeah, designed by the fortunes of war between European powers, all of whom were heading in the same direction. One island is at the far end of the Bay of Bengal and at the head of the Straits of Malacca and the other at the end of the Straits of Malacca and at the opening into the South China Sea. For the one, Province Wellesley became the necessary interland, for the other, there was Johor. And yet the difference between the two was great, mainly because the, Brit the Britain that acquired Penang and the Britain that acquired Singapore were different animals. The Napoleonic Wars were what differentiated them. The ambitions and self-image of pre-Napoleon Britain and those of post-Napoleon Britain were different in that the former could not imagine the dreams of empire that the latter could not resist. While the strategic reasons for founding Penang seem to have been about securing a safe haven for British shipping in the face of powerful enemies and bad weather, Singapore was founded to secure a route to China at a time when Britain's European foes were in decline. That was why Penang would soon become a hazard and a secondary port as far as the empire building project was concerned. 
and would settle for being a cultural center instead of an administrative hub. For Singapore, the growth in strength and innovation following its founding was great when compared to finance. And so, taking the credit for the founding of Singapore became a claim to strategic ingenuity more than to administrative acumen. Nadia's book, in many parts, reads like a court case, a CSI episode, where evidence is presented to the reading jury for the plaintiff, Bakwa, and against the accused, Rafael. One should remind oneself when reading such parts that the accused has not been silent or helpless. On the contrary, Rafael's case has been the one presented to the world over the last two centuries, while it is the Bakwa side of the story that has been silent or silenced. <coughs> The wrong is being righted here, and against 200 years of received photoshopped history. No doubt, when Singapore's foundation first being laid, Parkour was the man responsible. Raffles was hardly there. But then, Raffles was Parkour's superior, despite Parkour's greater experience as administrator and as a colonial officer stationed in the Indian archipelago. Thus, it is a sobering fact that Parkour is so strongly erased from Singapore's history, Tellingly, the tentative mention of Singapore or Fakwa Straits between Johor and Singapore in the 1820 map, which Nadia showed earlier. You find it on page 127 in the book. In effect, the first map of Singapore, really, made following, made following a survey ordered by Fakwa, would not carry the letter name in a map from 1825. For those who know Singapore, this is actually the strait between Singapore itself and Pulau Ubin. which is where you go now to watch the planes come in today. As Nadia notes on page 131, and I quote, As can happen in bureaucracies, the initiatives and work accomplished by a, by a subordinate are attributed to a higher authority. And in Singapore, Raffles was given the credit for Pakua's achievements and ideas. While this helped mythologize Raffles, conversely, it lessened the chances of Pakua receiving the credit due him. Now the timing of this book to appear is perfect. I congratulate Nadia again and the publishers for this thoroughly researched book. In two years time, Singapore will be celebrating the 200th year of its founding. So by whom and for what the founding happened will be asked more persistently than ever over the last, the next coming two years. What also makes the story of Vietnam Park more especially interesting is how it shows that Singapore's growth was an immediate loss to British Malacca. Papua's good connections and reputation as governor of Malacca for 20 years quickly attracted businessmen and others from the old port to this new island of opportunity. Thus, the population of Singapore was already at 2,000 in May 1819, and by 1823, and Papua left, was at 5,000, half of whom were from Malacca. This is more than just a transfer of businesses and skills. It was also a transfer of culture. The Malaccan cultural hybrid we know as Babaism became to an extent the culture of the early settlers of Chinese origins in Singapore. This is somewhat reminiscent of the Penang story, where the settled population in 1792, six years as well after its founding, had reached 8,000. And the mobile population was around 2,000 at, that any, at any one time during that period. To be sure, the influx of Penang in this area period was probably culturally more diverse than in the Singapore case. The migrants coming from Southern Thailand, Selangor, Malacca, Sumatra, Kedah, and the Philippines. This book also, also pushed me to think of the relationship between economics and politics, between the businessmen and the administrator, whenever the building of a new polity is concerned. In the case of Singapore, economics seemed to have had priority over politics, just as it would in 1959, really. The letter sets up shop and immediately provides great freedoms for the commercial sector before it then establishes itself as a prosperous and thriving administration. Now, the story of William Farquhar and Stanford Raffles is set in a time when global power, global economics, global knowledge global culture even, came to the region in a big way. This revisiting of the early 19th century makes obvious one important condition that Southeast Asia has had to live with. 
The region was a checkerboard for global players, a playground for external powers, and thus immediately subjected to the personal and petty battles these global players fought. Now all history has to deal with the question of whether history is made by individuals, or by the masses, or by events. As, when Karl, as even Karl Marx said, and I quote here at length, men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. The tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living, and just as they seem to be occupied with revolutionizing themselves and things, creating something that did not exist before. Precisely in such epochs of revolutionary crisis, they anxiously conjure up the spirits of the past to their service, borrowing from them names, battle slogans, and custom costumes. In order to present this new scene in world history in time-honored disguise and borrowed language. Unquote. The book, a book such as the one being launched today, of course, highlights the role of the individual. This in itself leads me to ponder a few related questions. Was not Singapore founded by the British Empire of the post-Napoleonic Wars version through its agent, the East India Company, and not by this or that person? Would not Riau have sufficed in functioning as the key port in Britain's expansion towards China? And if the Dutch had succeeded in keeping the British out of the southern end of the Straits of Malacca, would war not have broken out? A war that they probably eventually would have lost the rising power of Britain, whose forces were growing too quickly at that time to be constrained. These may be counterfactual questions, but they are worth thinking about. How much of history is made by the individual, and how much by the forces of the times? It also leads to questions about Singapore. Is Singapore's success due to its inherent qualities and advantages in the global context? Or is it due to, the, to its founding at the beginning of a period when the British were unstoppable? The difficulties of what encountered during the first few years would suggest, suggest that Singapore was far from an easy place to colonize or develop. And what was accomplished in its first years under the British was due to the administrative abilities of Farquhar and to his knowledge of local politics. Lack of supplies and staffing, uncertainties over funding, and even over the future of British possession of the island, jealousies in the chain of command, and the distance of communication between Singapore and Calcutta via Vancouver were serious hindrances that had to be handled. And under more pressure, the closer one was to the realities on the ground. British, British confidence and naval prowess were on the rise, and Stanford Raffles for all his faults or as was evident in his faults, was a child of his time. Perhaps the eldest child of his time for aggressive British intrusion into East Asia was concerned. Rash and impractical, but pushing the older regime into new territories they would not happily venture into. In Raffles' mind, Singapore was at peace in a game he might have ambitioned that would secure for Britain, and himself, of course, a sizable colony closer to the Sunda states, streets perhaps to replace or at least challenge the Dutch colony of Java, which he once ruled and had lost. Tellingly, as Nadia states on page 165, for those who want to look at that, Raffles saw Singapore as the British port, Wang Papua considered it, quote unquote, the Malay port, which still belonged to the Malay leaders. So I see in that difference here, a shift in how the British saw themselves and how the dreams of the British were changing. And Raffles might have been one of those brash young men who, who, because he was impractical, imagined and pushed for impractical things that perhaps got done. Militarily, Singapore has never been an easy place to defend either. This was shown in the Japanese invasion in 1942 and in how much of its GDP the Republic of Singapore today has to spend on defense. Of course, failed attempts to gain proper redress when he returned to London three days before Raffles himself brings into focus several important points, or two important points at least. One pertinent to how power works, and the other to how power can be manipulated. First, even when a power structure realizes that it has erred badly in its treatment of an undoing, seldom will it act to remedy matters to the extent of a public admission of its failings. Second, the speed of correspondence 
or the lack of it, between hierarchic levels, influences, how power can be manipulated. In the old days, subordinates had to act according to their discretion while waiting for slow replies to return from their superiors. But as the speed of correspondence increased, the point was reached in our very recent past, and then surpassed, at which speed allowed enough time for superiors to consider the situation before reply before replying in effective enough time to get their orders transmitted and acted upon. Today, it would seem that we have gone past that. The speed of correspondences and of events unfolding occur at such speeds that there might no longer be enough time for proper consideration to be given to facts and circumstances before decisions are made and transmitted down. Fake news now gain greater potential in influencing events. Reading the last chapter, reading the second last chapter perhaps, where the court of directors of the East India Company judges the case between Papua and Raffles, one has to wonder how the lack of local knowledge must have warped the judgment of the directors and how that lack was not considered a serious deficiency of the court or the judging of the committee. Such anthropological deficiencies are still rampant today, I'm sure. Let me end here then by congratulating and thanking Nadia Wright and Antripo Public Publishing for this wonderful book. It continues the historical battle between the Balkoa and Raffles camps, but it cannot be the last word on the matter. After all, history is a living thing. There is no last word. There is only just one long, ongoing quarrel. Thank you all for listening. Congratulations again to Nadia and to the Penang Bay's Antripo Publishing. Thank you. Uh, keeping for that uh, very thoughtful and close reflection on Nadia's book. Uh, what we'd like to do now is to open up uh, the discussion to the floor uh, to, to ask uh, either Nadia or indeed Kibang uh, their thoughts or reflections and contributions from you. I just may start the, the, the beginning of the discussion with uh, two issues that both of you actually mentioned. The first, it seems, has always intrigued me, that you're positing two rather contrasting uh, ideas uh, that Raffles on the one hand and Haka on the other hand had of the role of Singapore. One, Raffles' idea that this was essentially a British port, it was uh, uh, the emporium for the, the, the East India Company and so on. And, uh, Farquhar's more benevolent view that this was a, a Malay or indeed a broader Asian port. Would, would, would you like to just expand a little bit on, 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 on those two visions uh, and how they reflected changing dynamics back in London, which was something that Kibane uh, mentioned in his own uh, presentation. stated that, and in, in fact they intended to build a customs house at the mouth of the Singapore River. Now I think he wanted it as a British port merely to stamp his own authority on it and, and to take credit for it and to distance it from what Farker was doing with it um, because Farker was ruling Singapore as a tri sort of triumvirate with the Temungong and the Sultan. And as Gareth said, as such, he saw it as an Asian port because the products coming in were mainly Asian products. They were coming into Singapore, there was um, bird's nest, rattan, uh, of course opium, and uh, spices. And then they went out from Singapore to the eastern archipelago. Now, Farmer saw this eastern archipelago as the best market 
for the goods coming in and out of Singapore. But at the same time, both he and Raffles saw the port as an important refueling stop on the way to China, because the British tea trade with China in particular had just es escalated. And with the loss of Malacca, at least momentarily, they needed a, a, a good refueling spot, and Singapore seemed to be it. Raffles, no, I better not say that. Um, <laughs> say it, please, say it. You're among friends. M among friends. <laughs> but um, Raffles also saw Singapore as, in many ways, little more than an opium mart to distribute opium throughout the eastern archipelago. Now, opium was brought out from India in, in chests, and each chest held about 40 little packed balls of opium. A chest would cost between 1,200 and 1,600 Singapore dollars, which was too much for many of the very small merchants, and they were small-time merchants. The boogies might have only a, a very small canoe, and they'd, they'd take back a, a small amount of produce. And also they couldn't afford the twelve to sixteen hundred dollars. But they could afford to buy one or two balls of opium. And so the idea was you could spread this massive amounts of little bits of opium right throughout the Malay or the Indonesian, you know, the eastern archipelago. God, I think I've gone off the point a bit there, haven't I? So I'll let you draw things in. No, we love your statement that uh, Raffles is an international drug stealer. <laughs> Just about. <laughs> One more intriguing question. I mean, the answer's there in the book, but it'd be nice for you to elaborate on it. I mean, it is beguiling that Singapore has invested so much in terms of memorialization and branding and so on, on this one English imperialist drug dealer. <laughs> hey, we should not get too smug. Francis Light, hmm? Opium, arms dealing to the King of Siam. So he was a drug dealer and a uh, 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 gun, gun, gun dealer. Uh, how do you explain it, Nadia, really? I mean, how do you capture this idea that, uh, as you say in your book, I mean, other, uh, other parts of the British Empire in the 1950s and 1960s, I mean, the strong sense of creating new national identities, which by necessity meant distanciation from, you know, the, the, the colonial past and so on. And Singapore in the 50s, if we remind ourselves, was a very interesting politically, I mean, it had a strong left-wing movement, a student movement, a trade union movement, and so on and so on. And yet, this man, I mean, this flawed, flawed English imperialist, has become a shorthand, I mean, a sort of marketing gimmick, and, and how do you explain it, really? Boils down to Raffles Hotel. <laughs> Raffles Hotel is synonymous with Singapore. No, no, but, um, well, seriously, that, that's something I looked into. Um, way back in 1920, when Lord North, a newspaper magnate, magnate, visited Singapore, he was astounded by the amount of memorialization of the man. And he, he put it down to the fact that, well, Singapore was a colonial country, and this is the 1920s, so that was fair enough. But then, we come to the 21st century, and Singapore, an um, ultra-modern, high-tech, country, as Gareth says, as this English imperialist, as its hero. Part of the reason for that goes back to PAP philosophy, meritocracy. And it was one of the PAP's key policy makers, um, S. Rajaratnam, who decided that Singapore's history will begin in 1819. Everything before that will be forgotten because it might bring up ideas of ethnic rivalry and cause racial problems. So forget everything before 1819 and have Raffles as the hero, a man 
whom Singaporeans could all associate with because they weren't really connected with him. He was an outside magnet that they could all be drawn to without affecting anyone. So that was one reason. But also, when Lee Kuan Yew faced the problem of how to cope with independent Singapore after Malaysia had expelled it from the Union, he sought advice from the Dutch economist, um, Winsemius. And Winsemius gave him two pieces of good advice. What well, sort of good advice? One, get rid of the communists. Two, retain Raffles' statue. And that's an analogy saying, say to international merchants, you can rely on Singapore. It's not going to go overboard. It's not going to get rid of your investments. Invest with us. You're safe. We have raffles. And it was a symbol of ongoing security and stability to promote raffles. And of course, once the Singapore government accepted that raffles found in Singapore, and even the late Lee Kuan Yew said that Raffles purchased Singapore in 1819, when of course he didn't, but if Lee Kuan Yew said he did, well, I'm afraid he did. <laughs> and uh, so it's really, it, it's, it's politics, it's the memorialization, and it's the continued memorialization. It seems there's, there's always a new boulevard, a new building, a new school. When they've run out of calling things Raffles, they turn to Stanford. You have Stanford Place and Stanford Road and Stanford Court. Now, Raffles' next name is Bingley, so I, I'm just waiting for all the Bingleys to arrive. Okay? Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant place. Let's open it up. I know there are also uh, some, some uh, historians of Singapore, in fact, sitting in the room. Let's sort of open it up to questions and, and comments and so on. Uh, from the floor. And there should be a microphone running around. So there's one in the front. I apologize that I'm not a historian, but I've worked in Singapore for 30 years. Uh, at one time in the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies and also in the Singapore Trade Times, the Singapore Tourism Board, the Singapore Economic Development Board, and finally the National University of Singapore. And I'd like to say, Nadia, I'm so amazed by the enormous content and insights that you have. And I'd like only to comment on the, uh, the recent interpretation of the branding of Raffles, of the usage of the Raffles brand. And I think it is really right on target, what you said. The Singapore government, and I, I used to belong there, I'm a retired Penangite, just like Wu Ki Bing, I've come home, but I do have a base in Singapore, my family is there. I'd like to say that it's all because of the strategic use of the Raffles brand. It's not because we hero worship him. I mean, can you imagine everything be being called fucker in Singapore? <laughs> <laughs> Hardly anyone walked there, 
although it was plied by a number of water vessels, you know, for tourist sake, you know, nobody wanted to really claim that statue from among the government agencies because it was a matter of cost. You would have to relocate it, you would have to maintain it, regularly you would have to watch that there were no cracks in it, no mold, no fungus, etc, etc. So this was in the 1999, uh, 2000, around 2000, just before I left Tourism Board and it was a hotly debated uh, football because none of the directors in Tourism Board wanted to pay from out of their budget the maintenance of this statue. So if this is just to, to, to balance, you know, um, people thinking that we hero worship rifles. Singapore is such a pragmatic nation. It uses rifles. And I'd like to conclude with that. Yeah. Uh, when I was in the sixth form, there was some mention in history lesson that uh, the city of Phuket also was considered by the British to as a rival or as an alternative place to Penang, Malacca and Singapore. Is the, the city of Phuket just a, a small thing to the in history? In, in, the, uh, in exploring whether the British could use it as a base? Um, I'm trying to think of Phuket's old name. Just so long. Just oh, so long. thank you. Get that bottled up with Lang Kawi. Um, yes, the British did consider that. They also considered the Andaman Islands, the Nicobar Islands, but they decided that they really wanted something a bit closer to the Dutch East Indies. Yeah, the Dutch East Indies. Um, their, their primary concern when they were considering those other bases was support, um, naval support because. They thought for a while that Napoleon might invade India and they wanted to be able to service their ships and provide provisions for the military. But those, those islands, they just didn't work out. They even thought of going up through them near the Mekong River. That, that They were just desperate for bases. There weren't that many around. What was the purpose of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands? Um, the same reason to act as a supply base and re refueling station for their ships, particularly during the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah. I, I've actually asked Selma to uh, I put her on the spot. She's the expert on junk salon. Uh, uh, it was Francis Lane. Wasn't it? Okay. Uh, should we say something? No, I, I was actually going to not say anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I think uh, the talk uh, really uh, shows how you know the, the talker, I mean not you, but <laughs> Raffles, can easily steal the glory from the doer, is Fakwa. And um, I I'm wondering how, you know, because Fakwa still imagined Singapore to be a Malay port, if it had not been swept up by this ascendancy of the British Empire, whether it would be uh, another kind of port that's more like Tomasek rebooted because Tomas, the, the port was actually in Tomasek before it moved to Malacca and was continued by the colonial powers and then it, it kind of returned to, to Singapore uh, or to return to Tomasek um, but it was just like at that period of history where you know things could not be it could not be just an Asian port it had to be part of the British Empire Thanks, Alan. Uh, maybe just to answer you, yeah, Marcus Langdon's uh, first volume of his Penang, the Fourth Presidency of India, has a fascinating section at the beginning, precisely on those debates about where the East, in East India Company should locate uh, east of Calcutta. And many, many places were uh, considered, and Penang was not actually near the top of the preference list uh, in the early stages. So. Uh, Read Marcus's book, it's all inside there. Okay, yeah, uh, two points to make, following from what has been said. Uh, first, that I, I would think today the use of raffles is not about the man. It's just like uh, Damansara is expanding all over KL because it's a name recognizable. So 
every every shopping mall that goes up on Orchard Road is called Raffles. And I think the Singaporean lacking an historical sense, yeah, you know, it just goes along with that. Now that's, that's, that's I think that's what it is today, uh, after the turn of the century. But if I go back to to 1959, to take off from, from what Nadia was talking about, um, I, I did a biography on Dr. Go Kingsley, and I think the idea of Raffles probably came from him, not from Rajaratnam or the one you start with. Uh, and I think the approach is actually uh, that of a, an economic historian. That's what he was, and he was supposed to take care of building up Singapore, the economics of Singapore. That wasn't what he was doing, it was what Lord King Sui was doing. Uh, and so, in his mind, coming straight back from uh, LSE, uh, and Singapore is a creation of globalization, it's not a local creation. It's created by global forces. And that's how he saw it, that's how I would, I would read how he was thinking. And there were three revolutions that had happened in recent times. Um, I will mention the other two, but the first one was um, the, the, the the maritime expansion of, of Britain, a late come already, and the founding of Singapore, and that founding itself was the cutting point. So whether the Marseille was there and how many people actually lived there was of no consequence to him because the new force was global. So all the local forces, regional forces, could not match this fantastic global force. And that's how he, how he saw it. And I thought I think that's how he wanted to create the new Singapore. The anchor point was this new revolution that covered the world. So Singapore is, as it is today, aimed for something that's going to happen, never something that has happened yet. That, that would be how I would actually understand why Raffles was so important as a, a symbol. Not about the man at all. But Thanks. There's a forest of hazards from taking that to here. A veritable forest. Um, thank you, Nadia, for your uh, fascinating synopsis. I look forward to reading the entire book. Um, I'm intrigued, uh, this perhaps narrows the focus a bit of our discussion, I'm intrigued in the relationship between Farqa, I say that as a scholar, um, uh, uh, the relationship between Farqa uh, and Raffles. Uh, this was not the first time that Raffles had a problem with a military junior in his administration. Uh, one recalls the uh, relationship between Raffles and Gillespie in Java, uh, which, um, which almost brought Raffles down completely. And I wonder if your researches into the Farca, uh, into the Raffles relationship with Farca, reflected also a problem between a civilian administrator and a military junior. Uh, I look forward to, as I say, your book on this, but did you uncover anything in this relationship, the civilian-military relationship? Thank you. I don't know that it's a civilian-military relationship in general, but I will say that Raffles had problems with any man in uniform. <laughs> um, he, for instance, made life very difficult for Colonel Bannerman, quite unjustifiably. He, again, denigrated Bannerman to the East India Company. As you mentioned, he had great problems with Gillespie. He also had problems with Colonel Robinson in Java. Um, he almost ruined that man's military career. Uh, but later on, he managed, Robinson managed to resurrect his career. He also had problems with one of his aides to come, the uh, Captain Smith. Oh, look, I'm not sure of the man's name, but he eventually had him sent to, to Calcutta in irons because he had a falling out with him. So yes, there is a long line of raffles disagreeing with military men. One reason could be is that military men follow protocols. Uh, they were used to obeying orders, following orders. And I think it was Bannerman who put it rather succinctly that Raffles considered orders to be voluntar voluntarily obeyed. And that didn't go down well with any military man. 
So yes, perhaps there was a wee bit of friction, but Raffles biographers would have, uh, they say things like, every man's arm was raised against Raffles because of jealousy. It really wasn't the case at all. Bellman was not jealous of Raffles. Farmer was not jealous of Raffles. They were frustrated by him and annoyed by him. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I've had women friends who've also had problems with men in the UK. So, two of my points in answer to your query. You, on one side of the Indian Ocean, you've got the Danish colonies, the Trankobar, Andaman, Nicobar, etc. And at the same time, late 1680s, you've got Fort Marlborough at Ben Coulin. So one side of the ocean, you've got the Danish colonies. On the other side, you've got the English. And they were both no good for naval purposes because they didn't have sheltered anchorages. The second point is you mentioned um, <coughs> Dr. Turnbull, uh, or as I knew her, Mrs. Louis Rayner, she would have found it ironic that we're talking about Raffles here underneath Mount Olivia, where he lived for many years with his wife. And if you go to the top of Mount Olivia, that hill over there, you'll see there are two houses, one a Raffles house and one Lady Olivia's house. Thank you. Uh, there are more? Yeah. <coughs> Good afternoon. I'm a librarian by profession, and one of our concerns uh, is the provenance of information. You know, that information that is presented to the public is true, uh, and we want to keep the information. The integrity of the information must be there. So, uh, Dr. Nadia, I would like to congratulate you for doing your research, uh, going to uh, primary sources, and coming up with a new analysis you know, of the role played by Farquhar in the early history of Singapore and also as the Trump administration would say are providing alternative facts huh, <laughs> to early Singapore. Now I would like to know how your book has been received in Singapore and whether there are plans to do a book launch in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Well, Thank you for those comments, but I, I don't really like the reference to Trump because I, we are so, I associate him with fake news and fake information, whereas I like to think mine is genuine. Um, and yes, the book was closely annotated, mainly to protect myself in case anyone in Singapore was upset by, I, by anything I said. Um, so I've been very careful with references from the East India Company records. And believe you me, I read through thousands of pages of them. The book was launched in Singapore on Tuesday night, and I think it was a success. I hope it was a success. Perhaps when the sales figures come in, we'll know whether it was a success. I think that's Could I add? To, uh, um, it was the same team who was in the Singapore launch. Right? A couple of important things to note. One, it was launched at the Singapore National Museum. Now that tells you something immediately, because it was in the 1990s, indeed, uh, that in some ways there was a, a, a breakthrough. The, the silver pen was, was uh, put on display in the museum, but far more important were the Farka National, uh, National Natural History Collection, the wonderful paintings and drawings that he commissioned. He didn't do them himself, a lot of people did, but we suspect there were uh, Chinese artists, although I talked to the curator, he thinks there was also some Indian influence. I mean, this is based on the basis of looking at the technique that was. So there's a Farquhar permanent display in the National Museum. So there is a sense in which, if not the kind of branding or memorialization that was spoken of uh, before taking place, there is a belated recognition uh, of Farquhar's role, and I think that the guest of honour at the launch was Professor Tommy Coe, who would be quite well known to many of you. And he, in the foreword to the book, uh, speaks quite eloquently, albeit briefly, about the travails of a number two living in the shadow of a number one, and 
and how, how this could be overcome. So I think there is a sort of belated recognition, at least in some quarters, where this would be significant if it were to be introduced, for example, in the school uh, history curriculum or so on. And I don't think that that has happened. Yet, uh, yes, it has. Uh, I think for at least the last 10 years, I read through some of the um, secondary textbooks and there were articles on that, and that's where I got that little excerpt of those school children who, after having read the, being presented with material supporting Farker's role and material supporting Raffles role, they still said, oh well, must be Raffles because everything's named after him. <laughs> <laughs> it just boils down to that. <laughs> Just very quickly, there were a series of articles in the 1990s when I was living in Singapore um, pushing this idea that the black boy deserves more credit. And I was very sympathetic to that and I thought, more proof, so that's why I'm very glad to be here today and hear, hear your views of the book, which I definitely not going to read. But there were articles in Straits Times in the media about 15 years ago. Um, mentioning that there is a disparity and there's an unfairness and actually William Farquhar deserves more attention, but I don't think anything came about that. I only mention this because it's part of the conversation. Oh, yes, and I, I, look, I have referred to that in the book. I think it was Theresa Lim, it's a more recent one, and yes, she, uh, was a, yeah, she acknowledged Farquhar and said it's about time the rest of the people acknowledged Farquhar, but it, it's the old story. People say, oh yes, very interesting, but it's Raffles, and nothing seems to have changed. From the 1940s, there have been articles in the Straits Times saying Farker should be given more credit, and indeed Wurzburg, who is a great Raffles biographer, suggested that it's about time a companion statue of, of Farker be built and put next to, to Raffles one. And of course, well, that, that was... What sort of sea posture? Oh, no. Oh, that, I'm, I'm afraid the statue of Raffles is nothing like the man. He was a very short man, he was very thin, he had spindly legs. Um, the, the statue has actually blown him out of all proportion. And, as most statues do, do, it is merely meant to glorify the man. It's glorification of bronze, just as his biographers glorified in words. He's a manufactured hero in more, more ways than one. I like that phrase, glorified in bronze, yes. <laughs> you notice the body shaming now, isn't it? You're <laughs> spending <laughs> that small. <laughs> Terrible! <laughs> Fake news and body shaming. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, let me see if there's a... Uh, yeah, there's some at the back. Hello. Hi. Hi. Just to um, carry on with the theme of what's in the name. Uh, I understand that Raffelsia is a parasitic flowering plant. <laughs> so I wonder in that context. Uh, you see, I, I thought that Raffelsia was to do with paraphernalia connected with Raffles, but, it, but it's not... Uh, parasitic flowering plant and maybe it's actually then mo most appropriate that Raffles symbolizes Singapore. Ah, uh, thank you for that comment. Um, I guess you mean that big smelly picture yeah. plant. Yeah. Well, again, Raffles has been given the credit for having discovered it. I won't use the word discovered because of course all the local fauna was known to all the local People. They were just discovered from European eyes. And it was actually Arnold, I think his first name was Matthew, Matthew Arnold, who came across that plant, or probably his Indonesian guide showed him where the plant was. And Raffles did acknowledge that he didn't come across it, it was Arnold. However, when all the paperwork went to London, to the Linnean Society, the secretary, Robert Brown, said, oh, he was sure that Raffles would like the plant to be named after him, so he would name the plant Raffalasia Arnoldi. <laughs> <laughs>
So that's how the plant got that name. <laughs> Very smelly, yes. Yes, please. Um, I just like to point out the same scenario is happening to Yaaloi in Kuala Lumpur history. So my mind is rather puzzled as to how so many historians here can narrow down founder. Like this historical perspective, centricity. Otherwise, even between William Farquhar and Rifles, there's clear-cut collective contribution. It's collective history of conscience. So, the same way, I'm just soliciting some ideas about this definition about a founder. So, <laughs> I'd like to know. I don't think you can put the founding down to any one person or, or any one event. It, it, founding is very, very complex. And when you come to Singapore, well, I was looking at just the relationship between Raffles and Farker. So my book was sort of 90% Raffles Farker. But if you want to look at the founding of Singapore, you've got to look at a much bigger picture. And two people signed that, or two parties signed that treaty. There was the Sultan and the Timangong on one side, there was Raffles on the other. And if you say because Raffles signed that treaty, he founded Singapore, why don't you look at it the other way and say, oh, the Sultan and the Timangong founded Singapore because they signed the treaty. The other thing you have to look at is the great impact of the, the traders. I, I think I mentioned the Chinese traders and the merchants and the Chinese money that came into Singapore. If that wasn't available, Singapore would not have developed. And you have the Chinese expertise, you have the boogies traders and their influence right throughout the archipelago. Founding is, it is very, very complex. But I don't think you can put it down to just one man. Raffles established a footing, and that's all. And all the others solidified that footing and made it into a firm imprint. Well, it's political linguistics, isn't it? Um, I mean, it belonged to a certain time from a certain civilization, a certain culture. Um, so, founding Singapore would be like founding America. It doesn't make sense. But we, we use that phrase. And it's actually up to us to, to not repeat things that actually don't make much sense. Um, it, it usually just, just means that uh, Francis Light attained Penang for the East India Company. Founded might be stating the case of Irrationally, uh, it's, so you know it's, it's like quite passe, but it's the, the linguistics are still left around. So we, nothing much to be done about it except to be Thanks. It, it's nearly four thirty, and uh, we do want to offer you the opportunity of a lifetime to buy the book. <laughs> signed by Nadia, but let's take if there are one or two other contributions or questions from the floor before we uh, close up for the day. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. I just wanted uh, to let you know something very special that there's actually a descendant of Akawat here in this room, and I'd like her to come back and maybe even say a few words before. Gathering of the clans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually great great granddaughter from the Scottish side. Yeah. We came over from West Australia just for your launch because I was so intrigued. And um, on behalf of my, my branch and family, thank you very much for bringing William to the fore. And I actually have a grandson who is named after him, 
William Hoff with Trahan. Yes, uh, it's all very interesting to me. So thank you for bringing it to light. Oh, thank you very, very much. How splendid. And, and in Singapore, we had... Uh, we had another great-granddaughter of Farker in yeah, Singapore. Yeah, they're all married. Yeah. <laughs> Farker here and Farker there. <laughs> have over 600 descendants, I was amazed to discover. <laughs> the Prime Minister of Canada. Yep. Oh, yes, the Prime Minister of Canada is a... Now, how many greats? Great, great. Six great. Probably the five or six greats. And he is from Nonio Clemence's side of the, the Malaccan side of the family. Yes. See, we thought that, you know, Justin Trudeau has just become everybody's eye candy. Isn't it? Oh, he's a good looking guy and all that. So she's just put him in the book for the sake of selling a few more copies. But that is not actually true. So, yes, he's, on, he's, he's a Malaccan. You can see where the good looks come from, isn't it? Don't you? Don't you? Yeah. Absolutely. Listen, let's, let's. I mean, we can't tr trump. Sorry. We can't um, uh, trump uh, the fact of uh, a Fafa relative. Thank you very, very much for, for, for coming all this way. It's splendid. Absolutely. Anyone in the room claim to be a Stanford, a Bingley, or a Raffles? Please speak up now. Defend the family's honor. This leaves me a very uh, pleasant task to invite uh, the principals of Entrepôt Publishing who uh, to come to the front to take it back and I think there's going to be a, a lovely little ceremony where we'll all go ooh and ah and <laughs> please, please give a, 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 a good hand to Martin and They just said thanks through gritted teeth. <laughs>
for all of us really, but uh, fantastic to see the culmination of all of this and to present such an important work, not only to Singapore but to Penang. Um, a lot of people forget that Singapore was all part of Malaya <laughs> up until only a few years ago. Singapore killed Penang. <laughs> Singapore killed Penang, and of course, yeah, yes, it did after it was uh, established. So we're grateful to them. <laughs> but it's nice as it is. Yeah, it's very nice. <laughs> but we don't have any grudges against Penang. <laughs> well, let's have a Fatwa Hotel <laughs> <laughs> in Penang. <laughs> right. So, so thank you very much from Entrepot and from, from all of us here, and uh, I'll leave Gareth to make some final comments. Thank you all. Especially we came we came from too. Oh, okay. oh uh, Keith standing here holding flowers. I thought that was for me. Nadia, we'd like to present these to you uh, from Marcus and Gareth and I, uh, and for coming all this way and doing everything you've done. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you already.